Welcome to the Norwegian Residence. My name is Harriet Berg. I'm the Norwegian Consul General in New York. Let me give you a tour of my home. In this space, I invite guests into my home for conversations, to build relationships, and to share our culture, values, knowledge, and ideas. In the spirit of diplomacy, these conversations aim to create a broader and shared understanding amongst the participants. The artwork here also speaks to the cultural history of Norway. First piece here is a woodcut by one of Norway's most famous artists, Edvard Munch, entitled Melancholy III. It's likely inspired by Munch's friend, Jappe Nilsson, who was, at the time, unlucky in law. Here we enter the main social space of the residence, the dining room and the living room. You can see the iconic New York skyline and the Chrysler building to the left and East River, Brooklyn and Queens over to the right. In the living room you can see two paintings by prominent artist Håkon Bleken and Bjarne Melgård. Bleken's uh, Give Me the Sun uh, references the famed playwright Kenner Gibson's Gengangre, Ghosts, in which the character Oswald reaches for the dawning sun and potentially dying at the end of the play. This abstract painting by Bjarne Melgor was completed in 2013. Melgor entered the Norwegian art scene with expressionistic and chaotic paintings. The dining room is centered around the extendable dining table and chairs from Eikun Furniture Company. These chairs, known as the Hattrug chairs, were designed by Fredrik Kaiser, one of the Scandinavia's most regarded furniture designers. The Öya extendable table was designed by Sigurd Riesel. Riesel's work is characterized by logical constructions where the form is decided by function. This next piece was completed by Kristin Hundhøy. These pieces are by Norwegian glass artist Kari Molsta. Kari draws inspiration from nature's changes and from the material itself. Thank you for joining this tour of the Norwegian Consul General's residence. I hope you'll join us at uh, one of our future conversations to share ideas and learn from each other. Design Diplomacy is a series of conversation events that take place in diplomatic residencies all around the world. Two designers get together and have this deck of cards in which playful yet intelligent questions challenge the players as well as the audience to consider design as a form of intercultural exchange. How it works is that we build international links for diplomatic representations, design professionals, as well as audiences. The Design Diplomacy was created by Helsinki Design Week. That was five years ago, and ever since then, we've played Design Diplomacy card games in over 20 residencies around Helsinki every year in September. Additionally, these conversation events have taken place in Reykjavik, Tokyo, in New York, in uh, Madrid, Oslo, Berlin, as well as Canberra. We at Helsinki Design Week and in Weekly, we believe in international cooperation and in the possibility to change the world through meaningful encounters and interactions. Sometimes all you need is a deck of cards. Incidentally, the word diploma derives from a Greek word that means a paper folded in two. Design Diplomacy is a conversation series hosted by the Nordic Consul Generals in New York. Uh, these conversations invite two design professionals to share their experiences and perspectives working in different cultural contexts in the Nordics and the USA. The format combines traditional diplomacy with informal dialogue about design as a means to share different perspectives on culture and values. This year's theme explores the concept of wisdom as expressed by Finnish architect Johanne Palasma, while knowledge aims at certainty, wisdom is grounded in the acceptance of doubt, uncertainty and the possibility of failure. Knowledge and skills are facts, whereas wisdom calls for relatedness and a distinct humanistic and life-supporting perspective. 
I'm so honored to be joined by two well-known design professionals from Northern Europe today, Francine Hoban and Einar Hagen. First, I will uh, introduce Francine Hoban, founding for partner, architect and creative director of the Dutch architecture firm Meccano. Her work ranges from theaters, museums and libraries to neighborhoods, housing and parks. Each design is founded on observation of people, location, culture and climate. Her work includes the Delft University of Technology Library in the Netherlands and the Library of Birmingham in the UK. She recently finalized the renovation of Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, originally designed by Mies van der Rohe in Washington DC. And today she will be speaking about the renovation of the New York Public Library at Bryant Park. Francine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Today I will be talking about the, what we call the Mid-Manhattan campus. Um, of course, it's in the middle of Manhattan. It's um, next to Bryant Park on Fifth Avenue and 40th Street. And it's not just the famous building, the, what we call the Schwar uh, Schwarzman building. Today I will also be talking, especially will be talking about the circulating library because this is the research library um, uh, with the two lions. What is, uh, here you see how it is connected to Bryant Park and where you see these vertical windows. It's where the stacks, where the collection or the archive used to be. And of course that's not working nowadays anymore. And on top of it was or still is the Rosemain reading room. Here you have some images of the stacks of the Schwarzman building, the central library, the research library. Again, they are almost empty because it's not, you have to realize that this building, no books go out. It's really like a research library with an archive, with an enormous, beautiful collection, like almost like in a museum. Uh, and this on top of that archive, the stacks is the Rose main reading room. Um, and it's one of the iconic spaces of New York and also with a beautiful ceiling. It's on, on top of the stacks. You have to realize that this building, the Schwarzman building, was built or was opened in 1907. And um, between then and now, that picture on the right hand said we made it 2070, the whole city did change. Um, but not only in, in, in buildings and the high rise around it, but of course also the whole library and the way we use libraries did change. Um, the idea of, um, of the Mid-Manhattan campus is that there are two buildings. It's the research library, what I just uh, did show you, but across the street there was this building the largest circulating branch in the New York Public Library system uh, with a lot of visitors um, and uh, over 400,000 collection of books. Um, and what was the idea? We made a master plan to connect. Uh, here you see a drawing of Bryant Park, of the Schwarzman building and uh, uh, diagonally across the circulating library at what was at that time named the Mid-Manhattan Library. Now it's named the Stavros Niagos Foundation Library. And what we made, we made a campus, we made a campus, yes, but also did a kind of um, what is logic to put in which building, what is most logical for the visitors. Again, in the, the big building is no books go out, and the other building is circulating books with other kind of services. Um, so we, we really made a whole plan of how to deal with both buildings and to make it logic. Uh, we work together with a local partner because as you told, I'm from the Netherlands and we work together with Bayer Blender Bell, with uh, uh, Elizabeth Lieber. Uh, and as you just told, we have done many libraries. I'm even called the library whisperer in the, in the United States, had the technical library, uh, the, the university, uh, the technical university Delft library or the Birmingham library or the Martin Luther King Memorial library in Washington and, um, and Bayer Belinda Bell. They were famous, are famous for all the renovations they did in New York. Um, we, 
made at the same time the whole plan for the library and the renovation and restoration of this building. But I won't talk about it today because then I need much more time. I will talk about this one, the Stavros, what is now called the Stavros Niagas Foundation Library. Um, and we always have been thinking how to relate in a logic way these two buildings from the perspective of the customer, of the user, of the visitors. For instance, we will make, uh, as you can see on this yellow line, we will make a new entrance, an extra entrance to this building. So it connects much more easy um, to this mill building in a logic way. It will be an entrance for the new education center for research for a younger generation also in that building. Um, you have to realize this is a picture for must be around 1920 uh, that you see on the right hand side, the Schwarzman building. And on the left hand side, there was a um, department store. It's, and that's the building. And so change the Arnold Constable uh, department store, what in the 80s, they did turn it already into a library, um, but it didn't feel really like a library. And what was special about the building is that it had a kind of L shape. You can see it on the right hand picture. There used to be a small pocket park. It had to, uh, it's a typical uh, New York thing that they made a high rise and then you have to add some extra public space. But with all uh, a, a blind wall with no windows. And um, the building had many, many columns and we had to deal with the bones of this building. And how can we use these? Uh, we had to deal with the structure. How can we use the, all these columns in a positive way? And at the same time, there was a big political, almost political discussion that um, we promised, or the president of the New York Public Library we promised to bring back the books that were in the building. But if we would bring them all back, it would be full of books. So what we did, um, we um, what we did, and you can see that on this diagram, that that the strange floor plan of our building with this long leg or this long arm, we made a cut in between, and then I created what I called the long room, a long room with that we could I could really make a shelving system with a lot of collection of the books, so that I get more space in the other floors to have more place for studying, meeting and uh, make a lower shelving system over there. It was very much, and also I really wanted to make from this, what the former department store now really a library. And like on the left hand side, you can see the library of Birmingham of UK, where we made these book rotondas. Or in the Delft University of Technology Library in the Netherlands, we made this um, wall of uh, hanging shelving system with a blue wall behind it, what symbolized the library. And uh, the, the, this idea of the long room was for me inspired by Trinity College Dublin, um, where you have, where you put all these uh, books together. This was the existing floor plan, the existing section of the building. Uh, you can again see on top of it, the, the mechanical uh, penthouse that was on top of it, but also the whole basement that was full of, uh, of mechanical equipment and what we did this is very essential is you can see on the first of all we used uh, we, we decided to use the lower ground floor i call it not the basement but the lower ground floor to make a library for teenagers and a library for children um, then you have the entrance level what's connected to fifth avenue with a mezzanine level what is a kind of welcoming space for all and on top of that you have three floors for what I call the circulating library. And what we did, we made this cut in a void and to create five floors to create uh, the, the, the book stacks uh, there, uh, what I call the long room. And on top of that, um, floor five and six, we created a kind of um, business library, a learning center, what has a different atmosphere. And on top of that, we put, did put the wizard hat, what I call the wizard hat, what has on top of it, in the head of the, the top of the wizard hat, is mechanical equipment, but it's really the space um, to have uh, lectures, to have events. Uh, it's a very flexible space with a beautiful terrace overseeing um, Mid Manhattan. 
Here you can see the way it was and the way we proposed to do it. And at the same time, you have to realize that this area of mid Manhattan is very much still Beaux Arts. Uh, you can see this very well on this picture. And Beaux Arts means a kind of classical architecture, but many buildings had a kind, what I called a kind of hat on top of the building. You can see it here on the right hand side, but even here at, at the, uh, a little bit more further in Fifth Avenue. So it also follows a kind of tradition to put a hat on a Beaux Arts building. We also use the color green uh, uh, to link it to the, um, the materiality of the um, copper what was used in these the other buildings. As I told you, many, many columns. This is the uh, um, street level on Fifth Avenue. And what we did, we did use these columns to celebrate, to come in, put lights, hanging lamps on it, that it almost feels like street lanterns entering you um, in the building. We created also what we did is to play with the columns, with the tables. Um, uh, we created what I call long tables, but like this is more a table for <clears throat> almost like a bookstore showing you the, the new collection of the library. Um, and here you can see that even more um, to showcase and the, the, the long tables, uh, they are kind of multifunctional. I will show you also the other possibilities, but they're hanging on the columns. The, 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 the structure is a steel construction uh, on the columns. Here a little corner to make an exhibition at the entrance of uh, Fifth Avenue. And here we go down to the um, children area, the teenage area with an own entrance and to create an atmosphere for the teenagers, but also to have um, space to uh, play with computers or make videos or podcasts. Uh, these labs are also here. Then the children area with an, again, with an own entrance, but because never mix up teenagers with children, with a kind of own uh, atmosphere and space for different age of children. Here is the space, what I, it's on the second, third and fourth floor. So this is the long room. <coughs> Sorry. With on the left hand side, the five floors of long room of the shelving system and on the right hand side the three floors of the circulating library the library the the long room is also open for the public um, of course it's making uh, the long tables are also inspired by the schwarzman building but even the the long room is also uh, in, inspired by the stacks of the schwarzman building but in the Schwarzman building, the stacks are totally inflexible and structural. And even to make a beautiful ceiling, have what is also a kind of reinterpretation, what we were inspired by the library, um, the main library. <coughs> Here you see these, again, long tables where you can sit and on a distance. So it's very COVID proof, I call it. Um, and we even developed our own chair together with uh, Moser, a new New York Public Library chair, one, who are uh, very comfortable chairs, these chairs. And again, it's inspired. It's kind of almost, almost winking or almost reflecting on the main building where we have also beautiful long tables. We have special ceilings, special lights to create our own atmosphere. And even this is one of my favorite spots. We made create a periphery seating so you can sit along the windows. You look back, for instance, on Fifth Avenue and you look back to the library. The materiality is very strong, very durable. It's, it's terrazzo and it's very well made. Um, to make that cut, the void in the building uh, was well, rather complicated in an um, in an existing building, here you see the, the introduction of the five floors on the right hand side. And here you can see that space on the left hand side, you're looking back. We, we made windows to the pocket park to create, to bring in light. So to the building, uh, it was for me also amazing that there were people working there already for 30 years in this library. 
they had no clue that there was a pocket park behind them. So we, we made these windows. And here on the right hand side, you look back to um, uh, 39th Street. Again, it's a kind of uh, reflecting on the stacks of the, uh, the main, the central building. But our stacks are flexible, they are not structural. Here you see the business library and the uh, learning center, two floors, again with a void in between. And there, what, what I again call, uh, still call the long room, we created small consultation rooms because it's very essential in a new library to have little rooms that people and project rooms that people can um, talk uh, with each other. Again, a long table uh, in the business library. And here you see um, how the building is a kind of celebrating uh, New York. This is this picture is made from the Schwarzman building to the Stavros Niakis Foundation Library, and it's symbolizing this together with Bryant Park, the Mid Manhattan um, campus. This is the way the roof used to be like, you know, not used by anybody, with a steel construction. We added the wizard hat. For me, it has a very New York feeling how these strong men made this uh, steel construction on top of it. What you can also see very well on this picture is the inspiration of the, um, the building that was uh, in, uh, what was my inspiration had to, to create the wizard hat. But also what we did, we did elevate the floor so people can sit on, in a wizard hat but can oversee the, para, um, the parapet. So they, they can see the city uh, because it's elevated. And here it's me standing on it. Uh, what is also nice, because this is more the conference area, lectures, it's higher. And that creates also kind of um, edge, what we created as a bench, that people can sit there, but also provide what is more the public area and what is more the conference area because the New York Public Library is extremely proud that they have an um, access free and um, you don't need to pay for it to go on top of a roof in mid Manhattan. This It's the only roof that is uh, free for everybody. Um, here is that conference space, what is inside and the view looking back uh, of the wizard hat, looking back to Bryan Park and the Schwarzman building. And here is me enjoying <laughs> on top of, uh, be, because you have to realize I'm now just showing that building, but we've been working and we are still working also on this building, but the, the Schwarzman building is, um, is an ongoing renovation and, the, and we always kept the building open and the Stavros Niakis Foundation Library uh, was a total, um, yeah, a total renovation and the building was closed for several years. And now it's new, it will be opened the 1st of June. Thank you. Next, I'll introduce Einar Hagen, architect and founding partner of Lundhagen. Over almost three decades, Lundhagen has been driven by a consistent approach, inspired by the Norwegian design tradition of simplicity, minimalism and functionality. Founded in 1990 with Sven Lund, Lundhagen today consists of over 60 employees. Whether for a small cabin or an urban master plan, Lundhagen's work reflects a relief in combining the latest advances in technology and sustainability, whilst making use of local materials and handcraft traditions. Today, Einar Hagen will be sharing his firm's work on the recently completed Dijkman Library at the seafront of Oslo. Einar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for this invitation. It's an honor to speak about uh, libraries. I think like Franz, uh, Francine uh, uh, talks about libraries and, and this place where everybody can meet and there's no, you don't have to pay anything. You can, it's welcoming all people of the city. It's a fantastic task for an architect to, to, uh, to build such a place. And we, uh, Lundhagen and Atelier Oslo, we are two companies uh, that uh, have been, we have worked together all the time for, for now almost 11 years. Uh, and finally it opened uh, last year, this, this new library. What you see here uh, on the screen 
is uh, most of the people for, for who has worked uh, with this library uh, as architects and also some engineers. Uh, two years back, where, where when the construction was um, the, the concrete construction was up, uh, and you see the special roof and 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 how this meets uh, the columns. And just to say, where is Oslo? Everybody maybe know. Uh, we are now in a part of Oslo, which is kind of a new part of the town. Uh, it's it's a, a place where it was harbor uh, activities and, and big motorways, and, and it's now a, a new city coming up in this area. It started with a new opera house uh, built uh, by the architect uh, Snöeta. And we, uh, now have completed this library just next to this uh, opera house. And I have kind of like four chapters uh, saying first a little bit about the di dialogue with the context. Uh, we have the, we have the, um, the opera house in, uh, towards the, the south. And people, when we started this, uh, this work, it was just finished, the, the opera, and people Everybody in Oslo loved this opera house, so it was people were anxious. What can happen now? Maybe will this, the new library will destroy the view towards the opera and etc. Um, so and we and uh, it was a big competition, like twenty teams from all over the world, and we were so happy we could attend this competition. It was really uh, we didn't think we could do that, but they accepted us and we started working uh, in with the maybe, maybe we did like 50 different physical models uh, because we think physical models is a very good way to collaborate within the office to, because you don't kind of own it that much as a drawing. We can, this is a teamwork, we work together and we, we move things around in, in the physical uh, model. And this place, just beside the opera, uh, it was said to all the 20 competitors, it, we should, when you come down the main road in Oslo, facing the railway station, uh, you should still, could, you should st still see the um, declining line of the opera. So that's why we had to cut the facade. And all the competitors had to do the same. We should uh, after the, the, the library was open, the, the declining line here of the opera roof should be visible from, from the station. And after working with all these different models, we came up with the idea maybe we should, we, we must have this diagonal cut to, to, to see this opera. Maybe we could make some more diagonal cuts uh, because we're not working only with the library, but with the student housing and uh, office building. We made a new diagonal cut and, and made this into a uh, composition in a way uh, that uh, would uh, benefit for the um, pedestrians, we think. It's more, more interesting to walk in these uh, diagonal streets and, and here we could have cafes and, and um, shops and the library uh, activating the streets. And we also saw that we, we didn't only, we must have this diagonal cut to, to see the, the, the library uh, because this was uh, decided, uh, but we could also cantilever above the sight line. And this, in this way, we, we managed to, to build uh, all the square meters that was needed. And also we can't deliver it above a street here because then, then, then uh, it was possible to, to build the whole square meters uh, within this one building. And you see here a rendering from the competition, the new library and the opera house, uh, trying to make kind of a dialogue. Uh, it was, I mean, people are so enthusiastic about walking on the roof of the opera uh, uh, but when it rains, uh, they should also be invited to the library and maybe be a bit protected because of the cantilevering uh, roof uh, and welcome into the to the library. 
And you see here the finished building, this, this cantilevered area uh, and, and this view towards uh, the opera and, and towards the, the main entrance towards the west. And, this, and how to build this uh, protecting roof. Uh, because we had these big cantilevered areas and definitely we wanted no columns down in front of the library bearing this, uh, this cantilevered part and we, could, we were not allowed either because of the, the view to the opera. So we had to find a good solution to how to hang these uh, areas up. So uh, after some sketching we kind of decided to, to use the technique of folded slabs. Folding the concrete on the, on the top roof, uh, like stars coming out from the three main cores in the building. Uh, then we made the, the, the concrete slab much more stronger than, than if it was only a, a flat uh, slab. Uh, and also by, by folding these concrete slabs, we were thinking maybe it could also remember, you could give some uh, association to nature, uh, the light coming down from skylights through these folded uh, uh, constructions. And here you see from the building site, uh, one of the skylights and the folding of the, of the concrete. The folding of the concrete is like, almost like you're folding, uh, you make a paper plane and you fold the paper and it gets, it, it gets so much stiffer. So we actually get, uh, we can have very, very long spans and we could also have long cantilevered areas. And this is the cantilevering area uh, uh, above the entrance, seeing, uh, you see it from the inside on, on the competition rendering. Uh, and this is uh, during the construction. And you see here the very, very thin rods that um, keep the floor up because under here is, uh, is, uh, is the void and the entrance uh, below. So, so this floor is uh, uh, steel construction hanging from this folded concrete slab. So this was the kind of the, the constructive, uh, th this was the mission of the, of the top um, slab. And here you see this same area from inside. Uh, and of course, this is uh, uh, a special place uh, lifted up above the opera. You, could all, you can see a little bit of the opera in front, but you see much of the sea and the Oslo fjord. So giving this space to, to, to the Oslo citizens was, was very important. And you see here also from, from below. And this, this cantilevering part is kind of making the climax when you go up all the floors and you come up in this room and then you kind of you you almost uh, like water goes down again and we had to build this uh, this uh, library in quite a small plot so so making this into a vertical public space was uh, important and how and how to come connect these different um, floors so people get the overview of what was happening inside so we 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 had to make this diagonal facade and maybe we could also make some diagonal sight lines inside the library and this is what we we, we suggested that that we had uh, three diagonal light shafts going from the three different entrances and all the way diagonally through, through the section of the building and up through skylights. And then all the different, all the, um, different floors became a little bit different uh, and, and, and they met these diagonal light shafts, they meet at, at the third floor and make kind of an inner atrium up uh, in the upper part of the library. And people sitting here on the different floors, they have the possibility of, of seeing not only people at the same floor, but also this connection through the different floors and down to the public streets outside. And also the opposite, people walk, passing by the library, maybe they get uh, interested in what's happening inside here. 
So for the, for the competition, we also turned in a physical uh, model of the void. So you can see people down to the right, you see the, 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 the measure uh, of um, the people and, and you see that these, the voids that were inside uh, in the library. And here you see a picture from the finished building uh, close to the entrance, one of the entrances. Uh, and you see not only inside the uh, ground floor, but you see up through the different floors. And uh, when there are people here, you also see the heads of the people sitting around these light shafts, reading or working or whatever. And here also you see up in another of these light shafts and on the picture to the right you see down to the streets through these light shafts. So we get this connection between street life outside, uh, uh, library life inside, even if you are up in, in the different floors. And you see uh, on this picture you can also see how the working, the, these spaces for, for people working around these light shafts because uh, the librarians uh, were very eager to tell us that a library was, is a place where people, uh, everybody's welcome and you should feel um, that you can be alone together. Being alone together is a very important part of being in a library. You don't, you don't, you don't have to have any appointment, you can just go there, you can be alone, but you still are together with with other people and you see them, you see them uh, on, on the, uh, the floor you are, but you also see the other people diagonally down through these light shafts. And there's a, a 3D model of the library. Uh, there is uh, entrances from three different directions. Uh, there are three light shafts and there are also three cores inside the building, technical cores. And, and, uh, and you, when we go up now, we can see how the floors and they um, change a little bit because of these light shafts. Uh, the course goes straight, but the diagonal light shafts, they are diagonal. And they, the light shafts ends up in these three uh, light shafts, uh, these skylights on, on the roof. Uh, and last, last theme, uh, library as a market space, I think is an uh, interesting uh, way to think about the library. We found this picture from, from a market hall in, in New York. Uh, and, and I haven't been there, but just seen this picture. And, and I think uh, it tells us about something about the library that it's everything is happening on the floor. It, it changes all the time. It can be different uh, every week, uh, but the ceiling, the construction is holding it together and it's, it's permanent. And we looked also into different libraries around the world uh, and we saw that the ceilings in a library is important, like Francine's also showed there, that the, the, the ceilings is a kind of a permanent thing in the library that is uh, very important for the atmosphere of the place. But uh, making ceilings in new modern buildings is also very often difficult because there's so many technical um, equipment in the ceilings. Uh, but here we decided we should have the technical equipment in the floors instead. And making not only the uh, cabling for the data and, and the electricity, but also the air ducts, uh, which is actually no air ducts, it's just uh, open air floating under the, the, the raised floor, uh, then we could have this market space floor where you can change uh, everything on the floor, but you still you keep uh, the ceiling is the same. And this is actually also a very good solution for, for making a passive house and very, very low energy use of the building. So, so we, we, uh, when we, we made these floors, we could make uh, ceilings that had very, very little um, uh, technical equipment in the ceiling. Just uh, observation, acoustic observation, was of course very, very important uh, because of this open space. 
And so we, we decided uh, to we design this um, pattern here, which is open. Uh, so so the, the air is actually hitting also the concrete between these uh, openings uh, in, the, in the ceiling system. And actually, when, if you see my picture here, sitting here at my office, we, we have um, uh, the, the negative forms of this ceiling in, in our office because we, we, we get them for free and, and that would help a lot on some of our meeting rooms. Uh, and we also made these negative uh, acoustic solutions inside the small rooms in the, in the library to reuse and to use the maximum out of the material. And inside this library, we had this tree light shaft, but we had also these three cores, technical cores with lifts and stairways. And around this course, we wanted to kind of find to, to place all the small rooms, the, the, the workshops, the uh, different theme rooms, uh, playrooms. Uh, so like shops in the, in the street. Uh, so not too much space within the big space, but spaces around the course. And within this course, uh, we should have different colors, different architecture, different interior architecture. It should be, it should be, um, uh, everybody should kind of find his own uh, space was the idea. So some rooms, this is just an inspiration pictures, different atmospheres, but not uh, dealing so much with the whole library, but these uh, kind of shops within the, the, the library. And seeing this from, from the basement, where we have the, the main auditoriums and cinema and things, we have also the main part of the books, and we have daylights coming down. Uh, from from the ground floor above and here going up you see the much more daylight you see the people around the light shafts and uh, this ground floor this big market space uh, where, where you also see these cores with these uh, kind of niches and different uh, rooms inside around the course and going outside you see the library as it is now uh, in front of um, outdoor space with a, with a small pond where, which is also going to be ice uh, rink in the winter. And you see a New York art, at least American artist, Perrier, make, made this sculpture in front of the library as uh, it was a gift from, um, from, from some, some association in Norway. Uh, and you see how the <clears throat> the facade is in this more Nordic light, and you see the more the evening light get, it gets a little bit more golden, and and it and it in the e more in the evening it get colder uh, colder light again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aina. Uh, thank you both for sharing these incredible projects. Uh, I think it's so interesting uh, to see these two together as well. Uh, and, and, um, and I hope that everybody is now tempted to go and see both of these projects uh, when, uh, when you have time. Now, we're getting into the second part of this uh, program where we will actually do a Q&A uh, created by Helsinki Design Week. Uh, and uh, where we will uh, have questions that uh, I know and Francine have not seen before uh, and drawing on the concept of wisdom uh, or knowledge gained through lived experience. So I have the cards and I will uh, read out the questions uh, and uh, ask uh, uh, Francine and Aina to uh, reply to them uh, and that will give us another insight into uh, how they work. Now, first question should be pretty easy, I think, um, but let's see. Give a piece of advice you wish someone had told you. Maybe it's good that, that you don't know everything, you know. Uh, maybe I should have had advice about certain things, but, you know, I could not imagine my 
career as an architect, what is not the easiest uh, <laughs> career because it's a lot of things happening to you, what, uh, what you have never done before. I sometimes say I'm specialized in things I, that I have never done before and I'm totally enjoying it. Um, but it's not always easy and um, maybe it's good that nobody gave me that advice to, uh, you know, uh, it gives you, if you get too much advice, um, then you lose even your freedom or your freedom, free way of thinking. So um, I count all my blessings. And Einar, a piece of advice? Yes, um, no, I think uh, coming out from architecture school, maybe you, you kind of learned that you should try, You maybe you're very ambitious and you want to make fantastic buildings and uh, but I think you learned after some time and that collaboration is really uh, useful and, and you should really try and, and get as much information as you can from other people to, to make a good uh, solution. Thank you. Uh, next question. If you were choosing your field now, would you choose to become a designer? I know. Yeah, I, I, I love my work. Francine? Any other thoughts on that? If I would, no, I, 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 you know, it's a way of living. Um, yeah. I would also like to um, to make movies, or but also the way the way I design is also almost like making movies or a sequence of spaces, and etc. So I really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very much addicted to it. Yes. <laughs> I understand. Um, now, uh, what are you currently working on? Uh, Francine, we know you're still, I guess you're still kind of working on, at least mentally, uh, on uh, the New York Public Library, but uh, uh, what else? I'm also working in, um, in Toronto on Trinity College, who wants to become the most sustainable college and educate their students into sustainability um, of Canada. Uh, and uh, I'm working on the um, total renovation of the Dutch National Bank. That's also extremely interesting because it's also an existing building of a yeah. mid-century modern building. And yeah, and we also, uh, I'm, but I've, I'm, but I'm also at the same time working to make um, a whole master plan of Rotterdam South, uh, what is a very poor area in the Netherlands. So I also want to, yeah, I like to work on public things, yes. Yeah. And uh, Einar? Yes, uh, in our office we, we work with big projects and also very, very small projects. And, and after doing this library for 11 years, I think it was very nice to, to go a little bit back also to the small projects uh, because do, when you when you work with these uh, big projects there's so many people to discuss with and and it's like 100 consultants and and to make a decision it takes a year but when when you have a small private task you can just you just decide on uh, around the table and that's fantastic i think Great. Okay, next question. Uh, what skills did your grandparents have that you are jealous of? Yes, I, I think I had, I had some grandparents that were really good in, in different languages. Uh, and they, they said, you, you, of course, you, you read uh, this book on the original language. That's what they said. And I, uh, I admire that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have it. Okay, and Francine? It's uh, it's funny you ask this because one one grandfather, although uh, was a doctor of a village, so um, and the other one was a mayor of a small village, and but I both never met them because they did they pass away both in the year that I was born, but I think I have a background from my parents or my both families have from my father's side and my mother's side that um, that you have to take care of everybody like if you are even if you're a doctor or you are a mayor and you belong to the 
certain um, society, uh, a certain level in the society, that you have to take care of uh, of the whole population. So the uh, noblesse oblige. Yes. So what would you say to a person who says the world doesn't need more objects? Yeah, I, th I think that is. Uh, no, no. That is uh, interesting, and, and yeah, we, we we probably don't need more objects. We really need to rethink and 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 reuse a lot more of what we have. That I think that we we understand all over the world now, and uh, this is very important. Mm. And uh, Francine, uh, of course, that's a big issue. We really have to take care of the planet, and I think now there's. Uh, done also much more research, for instance, to how to deal with existing materials, or um, but also what we call the urban mining. Uh, that mining used to be what's happening underground, but in a way also buildings that are demolished, or what is now. Uh, uh, I think we were totally not aware that concrete is one of the biggest problems uh, in the world with CO2. CO2. So what you can do with old concrete and to reuse it and to get out the cement out of it. Yeah, it's a whole <laughs> more maybe a specific uh, um, uh, uh, specific um, uh, subject to talk about. But I think, yeah, it's extremely important about to think and to rethink materiality and also existing materiality. And that's what I call urban mining. You know, everything what's already built above ground, what we should reuse or um, yeah, how to deal with it. We really, I, I think also, also this whole pandemic for me is like, you know, the planet is protesting what we're all doing all together in the building industry, but also in the traveling. And we should really take care about uh, nature and people. Um, thank you. Uh, now, next question. Uh, what is the role of design in your home country, Francine? Um, I would say that the create. I, I call. The, I think the creative industry is extremely important uh, in the Netherlands, and I assume also in the Scandinavian countries. So I think we link very much together. Um, and. Is it design? It's, it's this whole thing of thinking in a creative way. And I think what is for me the role of being an architect and what I think is so extremely interesting is to bring uh, just, uh, different subjects and social uh, subjects together and to come into and to uh, find out new solutions for it. That's why I think this period where we live in now is so extremely interesting and, and important because we really have to think in an analytical and innovative and a creative way. And I think um, designers, architects, um, again, creative people uh, should play a very important role, but in an interdisciplinary way. Yeah, so we should really work together with other, also with politicians or with uh, mayors or hey, we should could, uh, and with uh, scientists and with the universities, we should bring this all together so we understand it and we can help and imagine solutions. And Aina, what is your take on the role of design in Norway? Yes, I agree very much with Francine that, that we should uh, really uh, collaborate with different, with a lot of different professionals and, and, and general people in our design. And, uh, but I think designing uh, and is, is very popular in, in, in Norway now and it's uh, uh, the people want to go into architecture schools is the number is increasing every year so it's really hard to get in to these schools uh, but at the same time is also right now the last month it has been uh, what uh, what they call the architectural revolt in in, in uh, Norway where, where they have this Facebook group in a way which which is very against the modern architects and uh, since I've been lived uh, some years I, I remember this also from earlier from Prince Charles and and, and, and other uh, discussions about architecture in the in the in 90s uh, where, where um, yeah people are 
kind of think that that the architects are a bit too stereotypic modernists and 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 elitists and um, yeah and they they want they say that people like traditional architecture and and that's what they should have so yeah so this discussion is going on very much in 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 Norway now hmm. good uh, next question who do you create for Anaria uh, of course, it's uh, the, the the client. Uh, it's it's like uh, the client is coming, and the client has a program, and then you have the 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 site, and the site is demanding something. Uh, so so and and so so the site also tells us something about what should be there that maybe the client didn't tell us, but and we try to analyze it, and and so it's kind of what the client says, what the kind of the site tells us, and of course, our own thoughts about architecture. And Francine, who do you create for? Of course, for the public uh, and also for the uh, future young generations, uh, because of course, for instance, we, uh, Mecano also, we also do designs for a private home or a private villa, but that's in a way, it's just for one person and we can make it very, almost crazy, very special for this person. But as long as we have, uh, as I have, uh, the, the, the possibility to create civic buildings, public buildings, I really want to create public spaces uh, and, and public buildings for all. And also be aware that, uh, and that's what I also try to do in, in with the New York Public Library, with, but also in the Martin Luther King Memorial Library, uh, a, a kind of timeless taste, a timeless beauty. Uh, I think it's important that the building, of course you can see it was designed now, but that it has a beauty and a materiality and an atmosphere uh, in, the, in the whole lighting system also, and then how we get in natural um, daylight and natural ventilation um, that it can stay there for the next 100 years maybe 50 years that's also okay but th that it's a kind yeah. of uh, yeah and that's different if i design something for one person or for one family or for a small group of people yeah good um now uh, we are getting towards the end, but I have a couple of more questions. So uh, here's another one, starting with Francine. Is there something you would change in your field's education in your home country? Something that you would like to change in your field's education in your home country? Uh, I try to tell, because I'm also teaching myself, um, you know, get the students out of, behind the computer, get them walking in the streets, let them feel, let them use their senses. Don't go, just go make many excursions, talk to people, uh, go to factories, fact go visiting factories and how things are really made. Yeah, wood construction, concrete, steel, uh, um, it's it's amazing to go to factories, but you also need a relationship. We as architects, how things are made. Otherwise, we are just photoshopping the world. And for me, architecture should touch all the senses, but we should also pay the respect that we understand how other people make your architecture. And that in, in this uh, essence of being collaborative, we also have to understand the, the industry and also being part of the innovation uh, of the industry. And um, and that's also paying respect, but it's also extremely important and useful. And Einar? I was thinking about the architectural education uh, today here in Oslo. We have uh, um, architects and also landscape architects uh, working a bit together. Uh, but not the interior architects. The interior architects are on the other side of the river, and that is very far, <laughs> not very far, but, but in, in, in professional life, it's also, it's often a kind of a um, controversy between the architects and the interior architects. And I think you, maybe this should be kind of, uh, would, would be better if they, we had more collaboration already at the architectural school. 
some projects together, some some projects different, but that that could be uh, because we are we are actually heading for the same goal. But it's just yeah. Interesting. Now the last question. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that will also be uh, a question that kind of fit well for an ending. Um, and that is, is there something you would change, uh, sorry, it, it, complete the sentence, the biggest challenge in my career? And we start with uh, Einar. Um, of course, yeah, it, just becoming a partner in the office, of course, was a very big challenge. Uh, I started working with my, my uh, colleague, but, but it was a partner after some years. And then, of course, then we started together. And, and that is, of course, a very, very, uh, it was some years with no money and, and just a bunch of work. And then, so, so but that I think everybody you, to to start a, a company it, it, it takes a lot of effort and it's um, it's it's difficult. Uh, so maybe that was the biggest challenge uh, to 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 manage that. And Francine, it's uh, funny that Einar mentions this part of our creative work. You know, we also have to run a business, and that's not easy. Uh, so I, I agree with Einar. And of course, I was the founding partner and I realized that uh, somebody texted me today that 40 years ago, I won as a student a competition. So 40 years, exactly today, I was started uh, 40 years ago by as a student to run my own office. And it's and I tell also people in my office in 40 years, this part has never been easy. You know, you have almost too much work or too little work or uh and to balance because you're also entrepreneur, but you also have the responsibility to take care of your people in the office. And we have about 120, 130 people and there are uh, families behind it, but also to keep, uh, I, for me, it's very important that, that I myself, I keep on educating and, and um, um, develop myself, but extremely important to, to coach and to let develop uh, all the people in my office. So for me, that's um, extremely important and and um, and, imp and a, a big responsibility. And at the same time, I love it. Well, thank you so much, both of you. First, for uh, being part uh, of this uh, program, uh, but also for all the beautiful, interesting, thought-provoking things that you are creating for us through that hard work. Uh, we are very, very grateful as, as a representative of the public uh, and of course also as a representative of the Norwegian government. Uh, thank you so much uh, and uh, I just wish you all the best for the work ahead. Uh, look forward to the opening of the New York Public Library uh, renovation uh, and also to be uh, going to Deikmansk again. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot wait to go to Oslo again. <laughs> oh, me too. Come to New York. <laughs> I love to. Yeah.